Hi, my name is Brandy Ma. I'm a neurologist and epilepsy specialist here at the Houston Methodist Neurological Institute. Today I'll be talking about the treatment of refractory epilepsy using neuromodulation. So drug-resistant epilepsy is defined as a person having failed two adequate trials of seizure medication. Unfortunately, a third of patients will become drug-resistant eventually. And only 5 to 10% of those will ultimately achieve complete seizure control with ongoing adjustments of their seizure medications. So this means that if a person has failed two medicines, the likelihood that they're going to achieve seizure freedom with only medications is very low. All medically resistant uh, patients should be referred to a comprehensive epilepsy center for a pre-surgical evaluation. This evaluation could include an epilepsy monitoring unit admission where the patient's seizures can be better characterized or localized, advanced imaging such as PET scans, magnetoencephalograms or seven Tesla uh, MRIs, and potential invasive stereo EEG or subdural grid evaluations. The definitive treatment for epilepsy includes removal of the epileptogenic foci, either via resection or stereotactic laser ablation. This is just a flow diagram uh, taken from a recent article uh, by Rivlin et al. and Lancet Neurology that shows the potential pathways that patients with drug-resistant epilepsy can go down. The thickness of the lines of the flow pathways indicates how likely a person is to go down during their lifetime. So we can just start right at the top. So with drug-resistant focal epilepsy. So the majority of patients are going to go down pathway one where they will continue to have uh, medications adjusted. Unfortunately, this is low risk, but low gain in terms of their ability to reach seizure freedom. What we're talking about today is going down pathway two to a pre-surgical evaluation. If they are deemed uh, candidates for surgery, then they will undergo a resection or a laser ablation, which is moderate risk, but high gain. If surgery is not indicated for any reason, then they can go down to um, the bottom, which is neuromodulation. Neuromodulation uh, comes in two forms, extracerebral, which is low risk and low gain, um, and this includes our vagal nerve stimulator, and intracerebral, which is moderate risk or moderate gain, and currently we have two devices in this category, the deep brain stimulator and the responsive neurostimulator. Neuromodulation is good for individuals with unresectable foci, bilateral or widespread epileptogenic foci, and for generalized epilepsies. The three devices that we have right now, as we talked about, is the vagal nerve stimulator, which is implanted over the left chest and threaded up the vagus nerve, deep brain stimulation, which is implanted into the bilateral thalami, and responsive neurostimulation that is actually implanted over the brain. We'll go into detail about each of these uh, individual devices. So the vagal nerve stimulator is our oldest technology, and it does not require us to know where the seizures are coming from. It's particularly good for multifocal or generalized epilepsies and uh, can be used all the way down to pediatrics. The VNS works via what we call an open loop system, uh, providing scheduled intermittent therapy every few minutes, no matter whether the patient is having a seizure. The titration and adjustment of this device requires minimal physician time and with the newer models, you can even uh, program it to up titrate every couple weeks so that the patient doesn't have to keep coming back into the office. Common side effects of treatment include coughing, coughing, hoarseness, and dysphonia. The responsive neurostimulator, uh, as you can see, is implanted over the brain and does require a full thickness craniotomy. This device, unlike the other two, requires us to know exactly where the seizures are coming from as the leads are placed as close to that epileptogenic foci as possible. It can be used for multifocal epilepsy or seizures that are coming from uh, unresectable areas. In contrast to the VNS, this works through a closed loop system, meaning that it only treats if it sees a pattern that, we, uh, that is thought to be a seizure. Titration and adjustment does require significant patient involvement as they have to download their data usually daily and then upload to the web uh, once a week. And it is physician time intensive as we do have to review all of the data that comes out of the RNS in order to better program the device to capture our seizures. 
the stimulation that the RNS provides uh, is usually not noticeable by the patient. And DBS, so DBS is our latest technology that's been approved for epilepsy, although it's been used for many years uh, for Parkinson's disease. The electrodes are uh, implanted via burr holes into the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. This again, since everybody gets the same implantation scheme, does not require us to know where the seizures are coming from. And it can be used to treat multifocal or generalized epilepsies. Similar to the VNFs, it works through an open loop system, providing scheduled intermittent therapy every few minutes. Titration and adjustment, again, requires minimal physician time, and the treatments are, um, are also not noticeable by the patients with minimal side effects. So this is a diagram coming from that same paper, just showing the different potential targets from the devices. You can see that they're color-coded. We can start with the VNS, which is here in green. So the VNS is threaded up the vagus nerve. And as you can see over on the right side, the targets are relatively diffuse, the targets including the insula and the amygdala. And then we have the blue on the right, um, the DBS, and it's threading all the way up to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. And this is, uh, the anterior nucleus is part of the PAPE circuit. And so we do feel like it does involve uh, the anterior cingulate um, and the mammillary bodies uh, in the hippocampus. And then the RNS uh, is a different device in itself as the leads are placed at the epileptogenic foci and, it, and the targets are right there, specific to each patient. A little bit more about the RNS. So the RNS continuously senses neural activity and in response to patterns of epileptiform activity will deliver electrical pulses intended to terminate seizures. We do have long-term data that shows that the median percent reduction in seizure frequency at nine years is about 75% with a responder rate of over 70%. It does, uh, studies have shown that the overall quality of life does remain improved over years. This is just a schematic of the different places that the RNS leads can be placed. There are two options. Uh, you can put, use cortical strips that can be placed over the brain, or you can choose depth electrodes, which can be inserted into the brain tissue. These are just common uh, ways that we can place them. So for example, in A, you can place them as depth electrodes into the bilateral hippocampi, in patients with bitemporal seizures. You can place them over eloquent cortex, like the primary sensory or the primary motor strip, or over language centers. Or you can place depth electrodes into lesions such as focal cortical dysplasias or periventricular nodular heterotopia. This is just an example of the data that comes out of an RNS. So in this example, this patient has bilateral depth electrodes to the hippocampi. In A, you can see that this is an electrocorticogram that comes out of the RNS, showing the uh, interictal activity. So spikes independently coming from the left, which is the top two rows, and the bottom is the right hippocampus. The second ECOG is showing a captured left-sided seizure, and then the bottom ECOG is uh, showing a captured right-sided seizure. The patient is given a magnet that they can swipe over the device at any time. And this allows the device to uh, pull that time point um, so the physician can review it. So in the top uh, figure in C, you can see that um, the magnet swipe pulled a seizure that the patient felt. And the great thing about RNS is that it provides chronic data. It's like a chronic EEG that we can continue to review over months to years and look at trends in data. And so the following uh, couple diagrams are, are trends that we can see uh, from the RNS data. Um, in the next um, scheme here, you can see that this is showing uh, interictal activity uh, over months. And most people have individualized um, cycles uh, of their epileptiform activity that we can see that often correlates to when their seizures might be occurring. The next figure here is showing when epileptiform activity likes to occur uh, throughout the day over the course of hours. And in this particular patient, you know, their interictal activity tends to be quietest during the daytime, but more active uh, overnight. 
we can also use the RNS data to uh, look at trends in seizure frequency. So on the bottom, you can see here that this person's seizures have been downtrending over uh, several months. And on the bottom, we can also look at potential changes with medication. So at that arrow, this patient started a new medication, and you can see that the uh, activity significantly decreased with that addition. Moving on to DBS, so deep brain stimulation currently is typically implanted into the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, which is part of the medial limbic system. The results of the Sante trial have shown that the median percent seizure reduction at one year is about 41% and increases to almost 70% at five years. The responder rate, uh, which is uh, greater than 50% reduction in seizure frequency, is also about 70% uh, at five years. Treatment efficacy does seem to vary with the region of seizures, uh, of where the seizures are coming from, and seems to work best in temporal lobe epilepsies compared to frontal lobe epilepsies. Current research is ongoing about uh, the use implanting the DBS into the central median nucleus, um, given its connectivity to the cortex and the basal ganglia. There is evidence that this may be a, a better target in people with generalized epilepsies, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, or multifocal epilepsies involving the frontal lobe. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. Please do not hesitate to reach out with questions.